Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 2? We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. Uh, we started this series last week, jumping into the book of Acts. We looked at Acts chapter 1, and we're going to get, we'll, we'll look back at that in just a second. But before we get to Acts here this morning, uh, today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is a, a special day for the church. Really, it is. And so what is Pentecost? And maybe you know, maybe you don't, but, but for uh, the Israelites, for the Jewish people, the, that was an a, a annual festival for them. And then, crazy enough, in Acts chapter 2, which I did not plan this, by the way. It was all God. I can't take any credit for that. We're in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, but uh, uh, here we are. Um, on, and we see, as we're going to see as we get into Acts 2 this morning, it was the birth of the church. It was the start of the church. But the, the Pentecost started out as the, a, a feast of weeks. It was a, observed about seven weeks or, or 50 days after the start of the barley harvest. And, and uh, so they, it became known as Pentecost because penta means 50. And so it was a day of offering sacrifices, but it wasn't just a holiday. It was a holy day unto God. It was a, also a commemoration of the giving of the law. And it isn't mentioned that in the Bible that it was this way, but around the 12th century A.D., that's what the Jewish people began to do with, the, with Pentecost. It was a reminder of the law and the birth of God's people at Mount Sinai. And so... It also leads us to the birth of the church we see on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. And so this is a special day for us to celebrate. God wanted to set in, more, in motion what he was going to do and how he was going to reach the world with the gospel message. It was through the church. And Jesus said, I will build my church. And so that's what we get to, we're part of all of these years later. And so... That brings us to Acts chapter 2. And hopefully, hopefully you've already read Acts chapter 1 and 2. If you haven't, uh, read Acts 1 and 2 this week. But if, and then for next week, I want you to read Acts 3 and 4. So let's get through Acts 1 through 4 by next Sunday. So uh, what we're doing is, is I'm asking you to read the sections we're going to be going through because we're not going to read all of that in our sermon. We'll read parts of it, but I want you to be familiar with what's going on so we can just go right into this. And so as we, we, we go through this series on the book of Acts, the desire is for all of us to see ourselves as missionaries. And we talked a little bit about that last week, that every one of us as followers of Jesus, as Christians, we see ourselves as missionaries. And if you're going to be a follower of Jesus and, and you're going to be a part of, of the, the Christian church, this is the only way it works, that we see ourselves as missionaries. Because if we don't, we're going to find out that we're going to become cynical, we're going to become discouraged, and we're going to get really depressed by being in the church if we don't see ourselves as missionaries. And the book of Acts shows us how the church should be theologically. It shows us how the church was historically. And it, what it does here is it gives us hope about the potential of the church as we read through the book of Acts. And there was this, this awesomeness, and that's what the church should do. It should exhibit awe. And there was this awesomeness about the local church, and that's what I want us to experience an awesomeness when we gather together and we worship. An awesomeness when we go from this place and we be the church out in our, our community and through the world. And if that's not your current reality, let me tell you, you're in the right place. Because this is what we're going to be pursuing together. A church that brings awe. Not because of us and because we're good and great, but because God is good and great and the Holy Spirit resides in us. And so Luke is writing this two-volume book, right? We talked about this a little bit last week. Um, and so the first volume was the, the Gospel of Luke. The second volume of this book is what we're into now, the, the book of Acts. And he's writing this to his friend. 
And this friend is this guy who is trying to figure out who God is, who Jesus is. And in chapter 1, what we saw was is our identity as followers of Jesus. That's what we, we saw there. And Luke calls us witnesses. We are witnesses. And a witness is someone who has seen or heard something. And they have something to say about what they have seen or heard. That's what a witness is. And so, just so you know, as we look at this, this is your identity. You are a witness follower of Jesus. I am a witness. And so in the book of Acts, we're going to see that the people in the church took this as their identity. Witnesses. And it was simple people who did amazing things. God's beauty was on display through human brokenness. And as we study this book, I really believe that you are going to get some hope about your own life. You're going to find some hope here. Because Jesus told his disciples, he said at the end of Luke, we see, you read it there, he says to wait. Jesus said, wait. And if you wait, he says, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And this leads us to the key verse in the book of Acts. And I'll put this one up on the screen here. You don't have to turn back one chapter. <laughs> you can if you want. But Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So this is, this is what happens here in the book of Acts. They take the gospel to Jerusalem and then to Judea and then to Samaria and to the end of the earth. And this wasn't just their call as the early church, the start of the church, but this is our call today, being part of the church, to take the gospel out. And I think it's great that, that Jesus mentions Samaria here because Samaria... They were, that was the place where, where God's people had compromised. Israel had been oppressed. They'd given in and, and they lost and they went into exile. And these people in Samaria began to intermingle and marry with the, the pagan nations that had taken them. And what happened was is they began to compromise their faith. And so the Jews looked at this group of people as the worst of the worst they were marginalized by the Jewish people. And Jesus tells them, you are to go there. Go to them. And we are called to go to the hard places. Not to people who just look like us, act like us, vote like us. We are called to go all places. We're actually called to even go into the broken places. That's the call of Acts. Chapter 1, verse 8. It's to go. Now, we don't go alone because we have a power. We get this power, right? And the word power here in the Greek is this word dunamis. And we can, maybe you can guess what word we get from that. We get the word dynamite from that. And so we have this internal power, this, this dynamite that's not from us. And God is saying, I'm giving you a power source. His name is the Holy Spirit. He's the third person in the Trinity. And you're going to experience the Gospel as a follower of Jesus this way. It's going to be in, go into the innermost parts of your heart. And then from there, it's going to go into the outermost parts of the world. That's how you're going to experience the Gospel. It's going to go into the innermost parts of your heart and go into the outermost parts of the world. And I believe that as we study this and we go through this, it's going to be so important for us. And that's why if you miss a Sunday, I'm going to encourage you to catch up, whether it's on our web page, our Facebook page, our YouTube page. Catch up and, and follow along, you know, hear the, or listen to the sermon, watch the sermon, whatever it is, because I think this is going to be so powerful for us as the church. And because what the gospel is going to do is it's going to get deep into your heart and then it's going to take you to the ends of the earth. And it's not going to be skipping your neighborhood. It's not going to be skipping our state or our nation. But that's the trajectory of what's going to happen. 
We're going to reach the people around us, and it's going to go outward. That's where God wants to take us because that is his heart. His heart is for all people. Now, how can we possibly do this? Well, there's an event that happened, right? And that event was Jesus rose from the dead. He is alive. He's, uh, the, the resurrection happened. And what we see in Romans 8, verse 11 is, is if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And so the same power that got Jesus from death to life is in you, follower of Jesus. And that's how the Gospel goes into our hearts and then goes out to the outermost parts of the world. And so last week, we ended with the disciples staring up into the sky as Jesus ascended into heaven. And an angel comes and tells them that, hey guys, you got this all wrong. And it's a bad day when you get corrected by an angel. I don't know about you, but I think that's a bad day. But these guys, they get corrected by an angel and they respond to it. They listen and they go forth from this and, and they, they, they change. And one of the reasons that we have such a hard time being corrected by other people is because we're not used to being corrected by God. And so when people correct us, we say, well, you just don't understand the whole story. Or you don't understand me and what I'm like. Or you just didn't get it right in saying this to me. But there's, there's something about listening to the truth that when people speak it and we respond to that and not in the way that, you know, you spoke it wrong or you didn't understand what's going on in my life. Like, like how do you actually grow in that? How does that actually happen in our lives that we can respond to those things in a right way? Well, we have to learn to be corrected by God. That's how. And so the disciples are corrected by God here through this angel, and they respond. And what they say is, is okay, we've got to go and pray. We've got to get along, and we've and we got to pray. And that's what they do. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? You pray. You pray. If you're back in Acts chapter 1, I want to look at verse 14 again. And it says, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And so they said, we've got to get unified and connected. And so we've got to pray. We've got to get together and pray. And so they pray and then they act, which is why there's this section there and it's written there about well, they, we've got to find someone to replace Judas, right? And what that tells us there is that God is very passionate about leaders. Talks about leaders and the, the process of leadership in all of this. And it's, it's very easy for us to devalue leadership. And in the reason it's easy for us to devalue leadership is because of abuse and scandal that's happened by church leaders. And people say, well, we just don't need that. We don't need leaders. We don't need teachers. But leaders and teachers are so important for the church. And what we see here is these leaders go away and they pray. And, and they're there on this festival, the festival of Pentecost. And all of the Jews had come to be a part of this festival. They're all in Jerusalem. And the leaders were together. They're in one place. And they're praying. And you can have leaders, but if they are not unified, whether it's the church, an organization, or a business, if they are not unified, that, that, that group is in trouble. The whole part of it is in trouble. If they are not unified... And so these leaders, we see them, they're together, they're in one place. And in Acts chapter 1, it says they prayed and they acted. But here in Acts chapter 2, they pray and it says that God acts. God does something. So if you're open and you have your Bibles open to Acts 2, we're finally going to get there, right? Acts 2, verse 2. It says, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind 
And it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So God gives them all these languages. And if you keep reading in chapter 2, which I hope you've already done before you got here this morning, but if not, what we see is is that there are all these people from all kinds of places who all spoke different languages in Jerusalem that day because of the day of Pentecost. And God gives these uneducated people the ability to speak languages that they had never learned. I've talked to missionaries before, and I've heard stories from missionaries Uh, where this has happened in their lives. Like they're out there, they don't know the language of the people, and God, uh, the Holy Spirit just speaks through them, those people's language, the gospel message, and it's powerful. And God still does those kind of things. It's something He continues to do. And so when you get to this part in the book of Acts, it opens all sorts of questions. Like questions about like, what does Chico first believe about all this stuff? Well, as we get into the book of Acts, we're going to see all of these amazing stories because I told you this isn't just history. This is church on fire, like incredible things. And so what I what we believe at Chico first is, is that God is a God who heals. He heals. We've seen it happen. We also believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking in other tongues. We've also seen other supernatural things happen that you read in the book of Acts dreams and visions. God does that. But let me tell you, all of this is done under the Bible, right? It's not, it never contradicts the Word of God, the Bible, but it is real. And so we aren't going to dig completely deep into all of this this morning because we're going to continue to see this throughout the book of Acts. And so we're going to get into it deeper as we go through the book of Acts and we see more of these experiences that happen in the church. So just know we're going to dig into this deeper down the road. But if you have any questions about that, feel free to come and talk to me. I'd love to talk to you about any of those things. But the miracle here in chapter 2 isn't that they spoke in tongues so much, but the miracle was that every single person heard the gospel in their own native language. Amazing, right? And so God gets His Gospel out through these people who don't even know what they're saying. And then, an uneducated fisherman gets up and he preaches a message. And this starts the church. And all Peter is doing here is explaining the ancient prophecy from the book of Joel. And he says, all of God's people are going to get God's Spirit. And it's not going to be just the prophets or the priests or the kings. It's going to be all people. It's going to be men and women. It's going to be old and young. And then he talks about the Gospel. He talks about the truth of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. And he preaches the Gospel this way. This is how he says it. He says, you all killed Jesus. Now, if you're sharing the Gospel with your friends, your coworkers, your neighbor, your family, I don't know if you start there, okay? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But this is where Peter starts, right? He says, you all killed Jesus. And when he said that, the conviction of the Holy Spirit fell on the crowd that day and worked in their lives. And verse 37 of chapter 2 says that they were cut to the heart. That means that they understood their sin in light of who God is. They understood what they have done, that their sin is what would put Jesus on the cross. And they said, okay, what do we do? What do we do now? Look at verse 38. Let's read verse 38. Acts 2. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So baptism, that is an outward symbol of an inward reality. It's also an identification. You identify with Jesus with his, and with the church, really. So I'm becoming a part of, of who, what Jesus did, Jesus' reality, that I was one dead to, to Christ and, and because of my sin, but now I'm alive in Christ because of what He did for me, His life, death, and resurrection. 
And now I'm a part of his church. And this all leads us here to where I really want to focus on this morning. And it's in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And we're going to read this in just a second. But these early Christians who had been cut to the heart by this message, you killed Jesus, who have repented, who have been baptized, they want to know what do we do now? What do we do now? And so Luke goes on to describe the early church life and what it was like. And in Acts chapter 1, we noted that they devoted themselves to prayer. So that's one thing. We talked about that last week. They devoted themselves to prayer. That was what the early church did. So let's read what they continue to do. We're going to read verse 42 down to 47. And it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so this tells us something here about what church was like back then and what church could be like for us and should be like for us. First, there was a, a, a devotion that was involved to each other. That's what was happening there. And, and you can't just slide into this as a follower of Jesus. You aren't going to get Christianity through osmosis. There's a, a devotion. There's a commitment. There's an intentionality that has to happen when it comes to Christianity. Following Jesus. So here are the three things. We talked about one, so that there's four, right? We talked about the one last week, they were devoted to prayer, but we're going to see three things here that they were devoted to that we're going to talk about today. And the first thing is, is we saw that they devoted themselves to God's Word. And there's a little hiding of this in our section here because it says that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. So what was the apostles' teaching? Well, Right? They didn't have the New Testament yet like we have it today. They didn't have that for a few more years later. Then certainly things were happening and it was being orally talked about and translated all over the place at this point. But the apostles were taking the Old Testament because that's the scripture that they had at this point. And they were showing everyone their, the, their teaching and they were teaching about it and they were showing where Jesus was in the Old Testament. And it's just like what Jesus did with the, the disciples. You see it in Luke 24. He took the Scriptures, and which was for them was the Old Testament, and He showed them where He was in the Old Testament. That's the, the apostles' teaching. And you're saying... And, and so what, what they were saying here is that the Scriptures is, is, is how it points to Jesus. They're taking it and they're, pointing, they're showing how it points to Jesus. And they're saying this is what Jesus taught us. And we're teaching it to you. And the people said, okay, we are in. We are in. We want to be a part of this. And so we see that God's word is the authority in our lives and over our lives. And so we're going to submit ourselves to the authority of Scripture because we see it as God's inspired word for us. So how does this work for us today? Well, there's a listening aspect to it. And so we need to listen to God's Word just as they listened to the apostles' teaching. And many times we, we think about this, you know, it's, it, it's sermons. And, and it's good for us to listen to sermons. Sermons are a great way for us to, to hear the Word of God and to hear it applied to our lives. And, and so I'd say listen to as many sermons as you can. With the podcasts we have and videos and all sorts of different things, it's amazing what you can listen to and see and hear. So go for it. Put it into your life. And one of the amazing things is that you can listen to the most boring, monotone lecturer pastor, just like me maybe, I don't know. You can listen to somebody like that, and I'll tell you what, God can still just rock your world. He can. And it's not because of the speaker do you know what it's by or the reason why? It's because it's not the messenger, 
It's the message. Surely God uses the gifts of pastors and teachers to communicate truth, but the power is not in the messenger. It's in the message and the Spirit of God that takes it to our hearts. And so these early Christians listened to the message that was being taught but, it, but So it's not only sermons, but you've got to listen and read the Bible. There needs to be this devotion, and we've got to study the Bible. Like, we need to learn some things about first century, or even older than first century. Like, what, what was the culture like? Learn to dig in to see what it says and what it means to us. If it is God's Word, shouldn't we study it and know it? We know so many other things, and we've got all this knowledge about all these other things. Let's become students of the Bible. And this is what's great about the book of Acts here. We see this demonstrated with, with the church. There was a group of Christians in Berea, and Luke was com- commentating on how they responded to the teaching and how they study, and I'll put this up on the screen, we'll get into this in more depth as we get down the road to Acts 17, but I want to highlight this right now. It says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So they didn't just believe what they were taught. They, they studied to see if what was being taught lined up with what the Bible said. This is what it means to study. This is what it means to take God's Word seriously in your life. Like you don't just accept a guy up on a stage with a microphone like me and just say, okay, he said some things, I'm going to take it. No, look and see if it's truth of the Scripture. If it agrees with the Bible. I've shared this before, but you know how people, uh, you know, how they train the people to spot counterfeit bills? Well, they don't just give them all the false, fake bills that they've caught throughout the history and have them study those. What they do is they make these guys and gals study the bill that, that that we have. And they study it and study it and study it so that they know it so well that when a fake one comes by, it is obvious. It is so clear. They see it right away. And that's our responsibility when it comes to the Bible. That we know it so well that when something that is not part of that, that doesn't connect with who God is and what the Word of God says, we see it right away. That's our responsibility. That's what it means to be devoted to the Word of God, the Bible. And if you try to just do that only by yourself, I'm going to be honest with you, you're going to get weird. You're just going to get weird. That's why you have to do your devotion with God's Word with, by yourself, and you have to do it with God's people. And that's the second thing we see here, is that they were devoted to God's people. So you study in community, you worship in community, you live in community, or you listen in community, sorry. And we do all these together. There has to be this community that we're devoted to one another. And it says here that they shared their lives, their things, but in reality what all this is is they moved past themselves. The hardest part of community is not focusing on ourselves. That's the hardest part. In a healthy family is everyone is, they're they're, they're like, they're not fighting to be first. That's where a healthy family is. That they're there for each other. That they allow each other to speak and when other people are speaking, they're listening to them. That's humility. That's when you aren't living in pride. Because pride can so easily get in the way of community. And the way that pride does that is it expresses itself through self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency says, I don't need anybody else. I don't need other people. And people that have self-protection in their lives are people who have tried to be in community at one point in their lives and something went wrong. It didn't go well. And let me just pull the band-aid. Any community that you're going to be a part of at some point won't go well. Something might happen, right? Something's going to happen. 
And when you get wounded or you get hurt, it's very difficult then for you to trust or for you to believe that people can actually be for you. That they're not trying to use you. Like we think, oh man, I'm just there and they're just going to use me for what they can get out of me and, and that's it. And so when you've been hurt and wounded, that's the, the thought process. That's how we feel. But the early church was able to be devoted to each other. They were able to just push past all those things and trust God with imperfect people. Pride also expresses itself through self-righteousness. And self-righteousness says, I'm better than that person over there. Than he is or she is. And I know that this is hard to admit. Maybe it's not for some of us, but I think for a lot of us, it is hard for us to admit. But I know that you know that there are some people that you think that you're better than. We all do. I do. Like, there's, there's times when we feel that way. And we say things like, you know, I know I sin. I know I miss the mark with God sometimes, but I don't sin like that person does. I know I struggle, but I don't struggle like they do. And what we're saying in that is that I'm better than that person is. Or my pain is worse than that person's pain. And look how well I'm doing with it. But pride keeps us from being devoted to one another. And somehow by God's grace and by His Spirit, these people were able to push past that and they were able to you know, have this great experience with community as the early church. Now go back to verse 46 in Acts chapter 2. It says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. The word glad there has the idea that it was just easy for them to get together. It wasn't hard. It wasn't like, oh man, I gotta go be with these people. No, it was just like there was a desire there. Like, oh, we're going to be together with the church? Great, it's gonna be awesome. I'm going to Bible study? Oh man, I can't wait. It's gonna be so good. That's what the feeling was. It was just easy for them. And the word generosity there, it's translated in other New Testament passages as sincerity. Another way to say it is intentional. And there are times when community requires intentionality. There are times when we just have to be intentional about getting together with other people because sometimes community is hard. And what we see here with the early church is that they pushed through all of that. They never said, you know, we had a bad experience there. We're never going to try that again. That's not how they acted. And, and we know that that following Jesus means that we are to love people. We want to love God and we want to love other people. That's what it means to be the, the church. That's fact, that's what Jesus said we are to do, right? It's that we love God and we love people. And Loving people means we love the church. Because the church is the bride of Christ, the Bible tells us. And so there's a devotion that has to happen to one another. And we want to love God, and we want to love His Word, and we want to love God's people. And we do that for the world, actually. Because as the third thing is, they were devoted to their neighbors. And there's something about corporate worship where we feel like, ah, oh, we just can't get too excited. Can't get really into all this thing. We get, we get excited about all sorts of other things, but when it comes to worshiping together, sometimes we just don't do that. But how did the early church love their neighbors? Look at verse 47 again. It says, Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, they weren't ashamed of who God is. They weren't trying to be ridiculous or make a spectacle about it. But there was this real, authentic celebration that happened. And this is what it means to love your neighbor. 
See, while they were praising God, they enjoyed goodwill with people or the people around them. And every day people were coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They were becoming part of this community and following Jesus together, growing together. And Rodney Stark says this about the early church. And I want to read this to you. He says, Christianity revitalized life in the Greco-Roman city. And it did so by providing new norms and new kinds of social relationships to help people cope with the many new and urgent problems that resulted from living in the urban core. To cities filled with homeless and impoverished, Christianity offered a charity as well as hope. To cities filled with newcomers and strangers, Christianity offered an immediate basis for attachments. To cities filled with orphans and widows, Christianity offered a new and expanded sets of family. To cities torn by ethnic strife, Christianity offered a new basis for reconciliation. And he goes on to say, no wonder the early Christian missionaries were so openly received in this city because what they brought was not just a new spiritual movement into the city, but a new culture capable of making life more tolerable. What if people looked into Chico first and they said, well, these people just make life easier. They make life so much more easier. And they may not believe what we believe, but they just make a difference when they look in and they see us. And I think that's what the writer of Proverbs is saying back in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 10. It says the whole city celebrates when the godly succeed. Because when the church is working correctly, there's a part of the city that says, wow, look at that. I mean, there is persecution that does happen with that. And we're going to get into this as we go through the book of Acts. But, but the city says, wow, look at this. God must be real because look at how these people love each other. God must be alive because... Just look how they live. And see, our goal is to see our city, our communities prosper, and we want our communities to benefit because that's what Christianity does when it's working correctly. That's what happens when the church is, is filling its redemptive potential. Like cities are changed, countries are changed, and it's not by power, it's not by force, it's not by politics, but it's by and it's through love. Love is is what conquers. And that's what they were after. And so what I want is for you to love God and to love people. And again, that's what Jesus wants from us. To love God. Love people. A bunch of people who love. People who don't just talk about love, but actually live out this love. We love the Gospel too. Which means speaking the truth about who Jesus is. That there is no other name by which people can be saved other than the name of Jesus. It is only through Jesus we find salvation. We're going to see that next week as we get into chapter 3 and 4. But we're going to have to love people well. That's the opportunity for the church that we have as the church. That's why we're going to study and go through this book. That's my prayer for every single one of us is that we truly love well while speaking the truth of the good news with love. But we can only do this through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what the day of Pentecost reminds us. We can only do this through the power of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost was a a filling of the Holy Spirit. And that filling is available for all of us. I'm going to ask that we all just stand here this morning as we close. And I said as we look at the book of Acts, we, we, we can't really go through this. We can't really... be a part of what God wants us to be if we don't see ourselves as missionaries, as witnesses, because that's who we are as people of God. We're witnesses. We're missionaries. 
And so for one this morning, you may need to just say, okay, God, that's who you've called me to be. And we surrender to that calling in our lives. Maybe you need to surrender to that calling this morning. You've been bored with church. You've been bored in your faith and your walk with God because you aren't where God wants you to be. You aren't living up to the calling of God in your life, which is to be a witness, a missionary. And so maybe this morning we, you start there. God, I'm accepting the call that you have placed on my life as your child, as your son, as your daughter. I am a witness. I am a missionary. And then number two. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can fulfill the calling of God in our lives. And we're going to talk more about this as we go through Acts, but we need the filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can truly be witnesses, missionaries. And so I'm going to ask you to pray for that this morning. That God would give us a fresh filling as His people, that we can go forth with the power of the Spirit of God in our lives so that as we go out from this place, we live and be the church, we can be a light and a witness and a missionary for Him. I'm going to pray for you. And you're welcome to come down to the altar and pray. That's where I'm going. We're going to pray for these things this morning. And we'll close here in prayer in just a few minutes uh, and let you go. But... As I pray, will you just take some time to pray over those two things? The calling of God on your life, witness missionary, and the power of the Spirit to be witnesses. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now. Oh God, I pray that we would just accept and live in the calling that you have placed in our lives, Lord God. The call of witness, the call of missionary. We'd recognize who we are. That it would bring us joy, that it would bring us purpose, that it would bring us hope to this, to our lives as we walk in the calling that you've placed in our lives. God, I pray that we would be devoted to each other and to your word and, and to our neighbors, Lord God. And that there's be this real devotion as we walk in that calling of witness and missionary. That we would be there for each other. We would love each other. And we go out and love our world with the truth of the gospel. And God, I pray right now that you would just empower us by the spirit that lives in us as your people to go forth with that message. That you would give us the words to speak. That you'd give us the opportunities and the people around us that you would have us to speak into lives of and share the truth of your gospel. And God, we know that we don't save anyone. That is your work, but you are using us in that work. And so God, I pray that we would be faithful in Jesus' name. That you would empower us by your Holy Spirit just as you did some 2,000 years ago as the start of the church on the day of Pentecost. God, empower us to be your witnesses, your missionaries. God, we ask this in your name.